Good evening. We're going to try and get started on time and stick to our schedule. I'm Bill Brown at Brookings Mountain West. Thanks for coming out on a glorious spring day. Spring may finally have arrived here. Quite a dedicated group. Thank you. Uh, we're going to hear from a, another Brookings colleague tonight, John Hudak, who's going to talk to us about a subject that's near and dear to our hearts, capitalizing in the nation's capital, which allows me to make a very subtle plug for a book some of you may have seen me waving around called America's New Swing Region, which uh, we published with Brookings Press that details some of the issues John will hit tonight about how this state and this region have entered that territory of swing, having gone from red to purple to blue in some cases, <laughs> and what that means for those states and the people in them. Uh, spoiler alert, in Nevada, we could be doing better. <laughs> <laughs> but John's been studying this for some time, uh, both at Vanderbilt University, where he got his PhD, and now at Brookings Institution. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, it on a national level, tell us a little bit about what he sees uh, having looked at Nevada. And I know you'll have some questions for him as a follow-up. John, I'll turn sure. it over to you. Well, th uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you all for coming. Uh, as Bill hinted at, the uh, topic for today is going to be accessing uh, federal dollars, federal funding. There, there's a lot of it out there, and I'm going to talk a bit about how this process works, what sort of political factors play into it, and how Nevada and the Mountain West region are, are doing generally. Uh, typically, the format that I take is to hold questions till the end. It makes it so that long-winded me can get through everything that I, I want to say. If you have a clarification question along the way that's going to be quick, feel free to jump in, but I'll take the more substantive questions uh, at the end. And so, We'll begin. So I'm going to overview federal funding opportunities in general. So there are a lot of different types of funding. Uh, there are uh, contracts, there are cooperative agreements, there's government insurance policies, and then there are grants. And grants come in a few forms. There are formula grants, which are typically uh, the thing we think of with formula grants or transportation funds. We have block grants that are often geared toward education and other purposes. And then we also have uh, project grants, discretionary grants. These are grants that are decided, uh, the allocation decisions are made within the executive branch of government after the appropriation by Congress. That's going to be the focus of, of today's talk. And I have data from 1996 to 2011. The 2009, 10, and 11 data do include stimulus funding, though I separated out at times. Um, the, the data totals uh, one point, a little over $1.3 trillion over this period of time, and there are uh, uh, 4.2 million individual grant allocations made. As I said, the focus here is on federal discretionary grants, and I'm also interested in looking at the types of traditional grant opportunities that we think of, uh, uh, NSF fund, National Science Foundation funding, other opportunities like this, as well as some non-traditional, some unique opportunities that we often don't think of in terms of of grant funding, but can really illustrate some interesting, uh, some interesting ideas and concepts that, that exist in, in the study of federal funding. And so the non-traditional grant program that I really like to use the most, it, it's, the, it's the one that puts this into the most perspective, is the Appalachian Regional Commission, which almost no one has heard of. And before I started studying this, I certainly hadn't heard of it either. The Appalachian Regional Commission is as it sounds, a commission that serves the Appalachian region. It supplies grants. It's a grant-making agency. It supplies grants to boost economic development, infrastructure, and income per capita within the 13 states that make up the Appalachian region. There they are highlighted in yellow. And as you'd expect, those states do pretty well with Appalachian Regional Commission uh, funds. They uh, allocate a few million dollars each year, depending on the budget mark, uh, to these states. Uh, depending on need, in particular states like Kentucky and West Virginia, they, they fare quite well um, because need is the highest and, and uh, uh, the Appalachians are, are their most challenging in those areas. The problem is the ARC doesn't just uh, allocate grants here, they also allocate grants there. So as far away as Washington State, the commission that's intent on helping develop the Appalachian region is supplying grants. Now, one of the most interesting things, these data are from 1996 to 2008. What you'll find interesting, and it's a point that I'll compa come back to, is that there are some uh, easily identifiable political forces acting on this. 
During the period, 1996 to 2008, you have Washington, New Mexico, Colorado, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Florida, all really important states in presidential elections. And these are discretionary grants that are decided by commissioners who are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And while there are a couple of flukes, we'll say Nebraska and Texas and Arkansas, generally these funds don't go outside the Appalachian region by accident. So why are we talking about federal grant funding? As I said earlier, there, there's a lot of money out there. There are hundreds of billions of dollars each year, or about $100 billion each year in federal discretionary grants in addition to formula and block grants. <coughs> but as it says up there, it provides needed services, it provides public goods, it helps state and local communities provide what their citizens expect. It generates jobs in communities. It helps uh, expand job opportunities in a variety of ways, not just in terms of the direct spending, but the economic activity that occurs around that spending. It helps, and this is the most critical, or one of the most critical things, it helps state and local governments balance budgets. After the Great Recession, uh, states and localities were, were flirting with bankruptcy at times, and, and in many cases, the stimulus bill helped keep these, uh, helped keep these governments afloat. So as part of my research, I, I did interviews in, in some of the states. And I went to one, uh, one state where an individual was in charge of the Office of Management and Budget, essentially the, what we call OMB in the federal government. She was in charge of it at the state level. And I sit down, and she knows what I'm going to ask her. I had sent her questions in advance. And I said, can you just give me a little bit of an overview of, of how, your uh, how your agency works, what challenges you face? And the first word out of her mouth was, this is in 2010, she said, I really don't like this president. I can't stand him. I am a Republican. I don't like big government. I don't like what he's doing. It's just, I, I, can't, I can't tolerate him. But I'll tell you one thing. If my state didn't have stimulus money, we would have had to lay off uh, tens of thousands of workers in a two-month period. She said, it kills me to say it, but he saved our state. And, uh, and, and this is something that often goes unnoticed when we talk about federal grants, is how important, how much states and localities depend on it. And despite popular reports, despite talking points, federal funding has extraordinarily low levels of waste, fraud, and abuse, particularly when compared to grant funding that is allocated at the state and local level. I assume that's not a surprise in this room. <laughs> and finally, and something I'll touch quite a bit upon, and, and my research does in, in fairly uh, specific ways, it satisfies political needs. Oftentimes, federal funding is the grease that gets the wheels of, of the legislative process moving. Every, a lot of people cry out about earmarks, and a lot of people cry out about budget deficits, and that's fine. But this is how we get other legislation passed. Historically, this is how we've gotten other legislation passed. For your vote on this bill, unrelated, we'll put, a, we'll put an interest state in your, in your state, which, as I've heard over the past few days, is sort of a, a sticking point in this region, in interstate construction. But in addition to just helping communities and, and, and the benefits of direct spending, there are also other peripheral political needs that are satisfied as well. So why focus on Nevada and the Mountain West? First off, I'm here. So I figured it would be nice <laughs> to, to make it relevant. But this area has a rapidly growing populations. All of you know this. Compared to the national average, compared to most other regions, this, uh, this area is growing, uh, uh, by most measures, faster than anyone else. In addition, there's growing state, county, and municipal needs. You're still facing lingering effects of the recession. Uh, Nevada has, uh, was hit hardest by the recession, uh, harder than any other state. Um, I was saying to Rob before, by any metric that I've seen and by any metric I can think of, Nevada was ground zero for the recession. What's more, political forces allow the Mountain West region to reap profound benefits. So some of, some of what I'll touch on uh, later, there are congressional effects that can help an area do well. So for instance, hypothetically, if the state had the Senate majority leader in it, they're probably going to fare pretty well in the distribution of federal funds. If they're a state that, again, hypothetically, might be important in a presidential election, they're going to reap a profound uh, 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 benefits in federal spending. So let's talk on that about the politics of federal spending. First off is the case for need. And this is something that, that shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be understated. 
there's plenty of need out there and and the federal government recognizes this in, in needy communities and needy individuals, organizations. <coughs> they do pretty well in the case uh, for federal spending. But there's more to understanding these allocation decisions and, and, and the numbers in the aggregate. What's more, uh, it's important, to, and I'll touch on this a bit later, to talk about the realities of budgetary politics, particularly when you're talking about federal grants. A lot of people think, and there's been a, lo a lot of rhetoric in the past few years, that we're not going to accept this federal money. We're not going to chase after these funding opportunities because we're worried about deficits. We're worried about federal spending. This is a problem. So we're not, gonna, we're not going to accept these funds. The problem is Congress has already appropriated these funds. If Nevada or the Mountain West region doesn't accept them, someone else will. Mississippi is absolutely ready to take this money off your hands if you don't want it, trust me. And they do really well for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is congressional pork. Mississippi historically has had very powerful senators um, since the Civil War. They've done very well in terms of making sure that for every dollar Mississippi pays, they get well over a dollar back in federal funding. Now, part of that goes into healthcare and education, but this is true in a variety of areas too. And again, earmarking, congressional earmarking, something that Congress was very angry about a few years ago and then realized that if you give up uh, your earmarking, uh, the executive branch does it for you. But this is something that has played into, uh, has played into not just the distribution of federal funds, but 40 years of political science research. Starting with David Mayhew in, in 1974, he argued that, <coughs> shockingly, Congress is election motivated. And one of the ways that they satisfy those motivations is through pork is through uh, uh, discre uh, discretionary, I'm sorry, not discretionary funds, distributive funds, distributive politics. That's how they, that's how they get reelected. They say to their district, this is what I've done, reelect me. Senator from Min Mississippi, reelect me. Congressman from Connecticut, I built this bridge, I got this contract for the helicopter plant, reelect me. And congressional pork, the study of congressional pork has dominated political science, again, for 40 years. What I argue is that there's more than that. I, I and a few others, but, but particularly of late, have argued that there's presidential pork and that there's presidential earmarking. This is something that sort of flies under the radar. <coughs> so my dissertation shows, for instance, that swing states receive quite a bit more money than non-swing states in the context of federal discretionary grants, where presidents and their appointees decide how the money will be distributed. And no surprise, that behavior ramps up right before a presidential election. It doesn't ramp up before a congressional midterm, it, it ramps up before the presidential election. <coughs> In addition, beyond, uh, beyond uh, my work, there's a professor at the University of Michigan who shows that during 2005, when four major hurricanes in a couple of months hit the east coast of Florida, controlling for wind speed and damage paths Precincts that voted for President Bush and Governor Bush at the time received dramatically more FEMA funds than Democratic precincts. <laughs> Another paper by uh, two professors, uh, uh, John Gasper and Andrew Reeves, uh, they, they titled their piece, uh, 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 oh gosh, it used to be called November Rain, and then they came up with an even catchier title. They found that controlling for weather, there are, more demo uh, there are more disasters in election years, in presidential election years. <coughs> Beyond distributive politics, uh, I have a paper with a, a Vanderbilt law professor that shows that, that uh, presidents think uh, outside the box about how to do this, how to engage in distributive politics. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the ways that they do this is through enforcement actions. So, Swing states have uh, much fewer Superfund investigations in them, particularly in advance of presidential elections. But then once a Superfund site is identified and, and the investigation is complete <coughs> and the cleanup effort begins, they get a lot more money if they're in a swing state compared to a non-swing state. Mm. Sorry, dry throat, I've been talking all day. So Tennessee, for example, in 2007, these are federal discretionary grant funds, which I've been talking about. They received a little over a billion dollars in 2007 in these funds. Not too shabby. I went to Vanderbilt University. We were the recipient of quite a few of those with three, uh, three major hospitals on campus and a, and a Research One university. They account for a bit. Memphis, the, the cities do well. The rural communities do well with agriculture grants. <coughs> Getting 4,100 of them in total. 
Of course, Tennessee is a deeply red state, and it's going to be red forever. And if you live there, you would know that is absolutely the truth. But what if Tennessee were a swing state? What if by some fluke, 800,000 people in the state moved away to a nicer, more conservative place, and they just left the residents of Nashville and Memphis, and maybe some of the people in East Tennessee to make it a swing state instead of a blue state? They'd get about $60 million more in grant funds and an additional 300 grants. So we're not talking pennies here. I mean, it, it, compared to the billion dollar mark, it's, it's quite a bit, but almost 6% more in grant dollars and, and uh, between 7 and 8% more in terms of account of grants. So the politics and realities in the Mountain West region of Nevada. There are swing states here, no surprise. Nevada's one. New Mexico used to be one, and for the, if the right candidate came along, it would probably be one as well. Colorado's a swing state. In 2016, Arizona's going to be a swing state. Populations, changing demographics are changing these states. They also have congressional power. There are a lot of senior senators in the Mountain West. A few of them have retired recently, but uh, nonetheless, they're there, including the majority leader, and their substantial need. Uh, again, this is no, uh, no surprise to any of you. There's really serious need in the communities in the Mountain West, particularly in this state. These forces, forces should come together. All the research suggests these are the three reasons why you get a lot of federal funding. Uh, congressional power, presidential interests, and need. But Nevada's the poorest of the poor performers in the United States. They're the poorest of the swing states. And I don't mean money poor, although arguments can be made. But they're, they're doing poorly in terms of their access, their ability to access federal funding. <coughs> so I'm going to put up a few numbers, and then I'll take a second, have another sip of water, and let you sort of soak them in. So here's what I call a failure in leadership and a failure in grantsmanship. On the left are all the states with smaller populations uh, than Nevada. And on the right are those same states, smaller than Nevada, that are outperforming Nevada in terms of a count of grants, the number of grants that they get each year. But who cares about the count of grants, right? What you're interested in is the green. You're interested in the money. You know, you can have one grant worth a billion dollars. It's a lot better than 20 worth a million. So here's the same list. And that, that list grows on the right. The states outperforming Nevada that are smaller than it um, in, in terms of actual federal grant dollars that they're receiving. This is, from, uh, this is from 1996 to 2011 and excludes stimulus money. Oh, well, that's an interesting bit. There you go, PowerPoint. I don't know how that happened. Uh, although I do have an idea. I'm absolutely uh, technologically illiterate. So uh, a, a few additional facts. Now, looking at it in, in, in basic terms, grants per capita. Nevada is, if you throw D.C. in, they're tied for 50th. If you remove D.C., they're tied for 49th um, in, in terms of, again, a count of grants per capita. They are 49th in terms of grant dollars per capita. So controlling for population, no matter how you control for population, that's also real grant dollars per capita. Um, they're doing really poorly. When in reality, based on uh, the presence of Senator Reid, Majority Leader Reid, <coughs> it being a swing state and the substantial uh, policy need that they have, they should be toward the top. Now, comparing New Mexico and Nevada, states similarly situated geographically, similarly sized, face some of the same, uh, some of the same challenges. New Mexico receives 101% more grants than Nevada, 159% more grants per capita than Nevada. And as the third line shows you, these differences are substantial. $300 million more New Mexico received in, in a three-year period uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's actually uh, annually. Average annually from the 2009 to 2011 period for non-stimulus funds. And 136% more grant dollars per capita than Nevada. So some serious numbers, some serious shortfalls for a state that should absolutely be at the top of the list for in this category. So what can be done? First, it's hard to change the politics. I mean, if these political forces are in place, and they're going to help or hurt communities, it's hard to change if you're a swing state or a core state or, or, or what I call a lost cause state, Massachusetts for a, for a Republican and, and Utah for a Democrat. But for Nevada, why would you change it? You have everything in place. You have the Senate majority leader. You have a, pr a powerful Senate majority leader, a guy who interferes with elections from Maine to California to Hawaii. He does whatever he wants because he's good at it. 
and you're a swing state. You've positioned yourself perfectly to, to, reap, to reap the benefits that the, that the executive branch and the, the legislative branch uh, can give you. So I have a couple of recommendations. First, some proactive approaches. First, I, I, the first one is changing the rhetoric. The rhetoric is really important to change. As I mentioned before, uh, there, are, uh, there are Tea Party talking points that if you don't accept federal funding, you're going to help lower deficits, pay off the debt, all of those good things. And as I said, that money's just going elsewhere. The money's been appropriated. Doing this, they're not going to return it to the Treasury and, and the new Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew. He's not going to responsibly just cut a check to, uh, to uh, Canada, Japan, and China to help pay off our debt to them. No, they're going to they're they're keep it home. They're going to send it uh, to other states. Changing administrative and governing strategies. This is really important. From what I've identified within Nevada, based on the fact that there are um, all of the political forces you need, there have to be administrative reasons within the state. A and part of it is a lack of effort, and part of it is a lack of expertise within the state government actually to reach out and apply for these grants. If you apply for these grants, it's not going to be hard to get them. As someone who's applied for a federal grant before, a very small one to, to support uh, research, there's a lot of paperwork. You have to write flowery language into your grant proposals and hope that you please the right people. But uh, again, back to some of the interviews that, that I've done in the past. I interviewed a, a, an individual in a federal agency who, and, and I'm, I'm talking in vague ways, but when you do research at a university, the faculty here will know you have human subject protections as if I'm administering pharmaceuticals to them and hoping for the best. And so I have to protect their identities as part of that. So I, I'm not being vague uh, for any reason but that. So I'm interviewing a federal, uh, a federal agency employee who deals with uh, making decisions, at least at the bureaucratic level, uh, for grant making. And he said, you know, we, we all get into a room, we score these proposals, and uh, based on a metric that we, we come up with or a metric that a political appointee sends to us, and then we score them, we rank them, and we send them off to the political appointee's office, and then we just wait to see the, the allocation list. He said, and the damnedest thing happens. Sometimes the things we recommend aren't on the list. And sometimes things that were garbage end up on the list. And he said, I'll give you a guess at what kinds of states those are in. They're in Wisconsin, they're in Ohio, they're in Florida, they're in Virginia, they're in Colorado. These things happen on a regular basis. And they should be coming to Nevada, too. So what's happening in this state is either they are not applying for grants that they should be, that they could be, that they're entitled to, that they're more than entitled to based on the politics, or somehow these proposals are so bad, the expertise for grantsmanship are so bad that the political appointees don't even have the stomach to put it on the list. Now that's profound. I mean, that is serious. To spit in the face of the majority leader, to spit in the face of the president of the United States who really wants to keep winning Nevada, um, that's intense. My guess is the applications just aren't going there. I don't have the data to support that the applications aren't being made, but uh, it's, it's hard to imagine otherwise. And then there's a lack of leadership. You have some states, Governor O'Malley in Maryland is one of them. He wants his state to apply for federal grant funds. It takes a little bit of a burden off him and his state legislature. It can, take, it can lift tax burdens in local communities and, and if you get enough in states. But he also realizes the benefits of this politically, sure. From a policy per, uh, perspective, yes. And if the leadership from a governor's office, from a majority leader, a state majority leader's office, a state speaker of the house's office, if the leadership can go if from mayors, from others who say, apply for those grants, my administration will help you. We'll, we'll find nonprofits who can help you. We're going to get this done. So you can design strategies to do this. And so um, an, another, uh, I interviewed a, an interest group who is pretty integral in terms of applying for grants for a, uh, a, a democratic state. And the agency who he was working with, he said, you know, the federal agency had uh, grant liaisons to grantees, uh, prospective grantees. And they helped us fill out the forms. They helped us navigate, navigate the waters. And federal budget cuts were enacted, and those were the first positions to be eliminated. He said, well, after 10, 15, 20 years of doing this, we got pretty good at it. So his state started going to nonprofits like his and saying, 
our liaisons are gone. We need your expertise. We don't have the expertise. Maybe we'll hire the expertise in the short or medium or in the medium or long term, but right now we just need to apply for grant dollars and you know how to do it. So if you, if you develop these innovative administrative strategies to deal with changing political environments, changing policy environments, changing environments in whatever fashion they are, you can still compete for federal funds and capitalize on the political resources uh, that, you, that, you're sort of, uh, that are sort of innate. And another key that I'll come back to is focusing on administration priorities. Uh, President Obama has priorities. Some of you love them, some of you hate them, some of you, don't, some of you don't care at all about them, but these are priorities, these are projects, these are policy areas that he wants funded. His cabinet secretaries have policy areas. Uh, Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, his time in, as governor of Iowa certainly informed him about what he wants to provide, and there are going to be grants for, 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 those, uh, uh, for those ideas. We'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. The other uh, thing that can be done is, is changing culture. I, I call it the we're not that kind of state syndrome. This is a real problem. People think, well, we just don't do that here, so, so we're not going to apply for those funds. You're talking about funds that are small. You're not talking about a, a, a $100 billion grant to fund something that you don't do here. I mean, uh, it, it's not like a $100 billion grant to help gaming in Utah. We're not talking about this. We're talking about small ball stuff that's going to help a local community and, and individually for a state budget might not mean anything, but the extra uh, several hundred grants for Tennessee, that's going to mean a lot when they start to add up. It's going to mean $60 million for Tennessee if it were a swing sta state. And I'll come back to this, we're not that kind of state syndrome also. But back to administration priorities. As I said, there are presidential and cabinet uh, level priorities, and, and there are a lot of them. It's hard to keep up with them, but one way to, to access them is to talk to the federal government, is for the governor, to, uh, the governor, his staff, to call the cabinet uh, departments, to call the federal agencies, to talk with the domestic policy advisors in the White House, to talk to the party, to talk to anyone who will tell you anything. What are the president's priorities? Or pick up a newspaper. The president likes green energy, he likes community colleges, he likes health care. You might not, but he really does. Health care innovation, research and development grants, and manufacturing grants. These are all huge ideas that the president and his cabinet secretaries have gotten behind. Green energy is being produced not just in the energy department, it's being um, a, the the uh, Agriculture Department has a, a vested interest in this. Governor Vilsack, uh, Secretary Vilsack now, this is a really big part for him. Uh, this is a really big part of his plan. Uh, Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, realizes that community colleges need help. It's the way to grow an economy that's struggling, not at the top, but in the middle. People who could get an associate's degree and help start powering the economy in a, in a multitude of ways. It's, for, for this, it's not about the four-year degree. It's about the two-year degree that's going to get people to work, that's going to grow the labor market, that's going to help out. And as I said, either talk to people or read into it or do research. But if you have staff assigned specifically to figuring out administrative prior administration priorities, figuring out cabinet priorities, and figuring out how you can take state, local, uh, state, county, local, municipal resources and needs and match them up with those priorities. And again, I can't stress this enough, have the Senate majority leader in your swing state, this is going to work out really well for you. Now that we're not that kind of state syndrome. There's, this, uh, there's sort of a tension between geography and tradition, and so um, in some cases, this syndrome is accurate. Uh, there are, you're not going to have a solar farm outside Seattle. You know, there are places where there's no wind, so you're not going to have a wind farm. Uh, th there, are, there are places where certain grants just, they cannot work for a lot of reasons. And then there's tradition, a and, and these are the ones that are most frustrating. So, a state will think, I'm not an agriculture state. Why am I going to apply for agriculture grants? I mean, outside of, uh, of the big cities, there are farms everywhere. So the uh, House Appropriations Committee has its subcommittees that oversee the appropriations of the cabinet agencies. And one of the, uh, one of the subcommittees of appropriation is uh, agriculture and, and uh, uh, rural development and related agencies. For uh, a four-year period, the, when the Democrats were in control of Congress, 
The chair of that subcommittee was Rosa DeLauro, a Democrat from Connecticut. She represents New Haven. I'm from the area. And uh, uh, you wouldn't know it, but there's a lot of farms outside of New Haven. So at first glance, you think uh, 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 another nutmegger, another woman from Connecticut, another person from Connecticut running the Agriculture Subcommittee of Appropriations. And she had her talking points ready. 364 farms in, in my district, or however many there were, it was a much higher number than you'd think. They're small farms, but she has a lot of farmers she can rely on to, to, to get this help. And there are other people on the committee too. I can tell you, her district got a lot of agriculture grants while she was the subcommittee chair. Um, partly because of the power that that subcommittee offers, but also because she's in a position to inform her district to take the responsibility as a public official to tell your constituents, here are your opportunities, go get them. Or they're going to be sent to Iowa, they're going to be sent to Nebraska. Again, they'd love to take your agriculture funds off your hands if you don't want to use them. And, and another is, uh, a, a, and so I talked to uh, another a political appointee actually um, from an area west of the Mississippi River and he said that he gets a ton of federal grant dollars to, to fund a certain initiative that was a priority of the cabinet secretary that he served under. He said, I feel like I, I'm part of a circus. He said, I, I'm doing road shows. I'm trying to convince people, just take this money, just apply for it, we'll help you write the grants. And, and people aren't budging because there's not enough of information being provided from state governments, from county governments, from municipal governments to inform people about these opportunities and to, uh, to, to help reduce the burden that local taxes and state taxes, income and sales, are, are, are having. To, it, it's, it's taking the burden off those taxes to provide what's needed for localities. The other, we're not kind of, uh, that kind of state syndrome, affects manufacturing grants. There are manufacturing facilities in every single congressional district in the United States. That's a surprise, it was a surprise to me. I mean, you think of Alaska, manufacturing in Alaska, what, what happens there? Manufacturing in uh, Charlie Rangel's district, he, he represents uh, mostly Harlem. I mean, but, there, but it's there. You have manufacturing programs. It's an administration priority. There are great programs in place. Programs where, for instance, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is located in the Commerce Department, it's essentially the federal government's consulting agency for manufacturing issues. They have an annual budget of between 120 and 140 million dollars. They go in to small and medium sized manufacturers and give them advice on how to reach new export markets, on how to streamline production facilities, on how to buy new equipment, how to find capital that they're struggling to find, on how to make uh, processes more efficient. So let's say 125 million dollars in uh, federal funding for this agency creates three and a half billion dollars of economic activity across the 50 states. I mean, these are the types of programs that are doing a lot of good in a lot of places, but not if you're not accessing those funds. And Nevada's not a, not a manufacturing state, right? You have, you have hospitality, you have defense, and you have mining. And if it's not one of those three categories, who cares, right? Well, it, Nevada lost uh, a lot of manufacturing jobs in the 2000s, but, and it was accelerated in the, uh, by the Great Recession. The Mountain West region um, lost 160,000 manufacturing jobs between 20, uh, 2000 and 2010. Those jobs can be gotten back. A lot of those jobs can be gotten back if you start applying for manufacturing grants in breaking that cultural norm that because we're not a manufacturing state, because we're not a farming state, because we're invested in minerals and gaming and hospitality and defense, those are the only things that matter. Once you break that, then you can start getting greater access to these funds. There are states that are great at it. There are swing states that are great at it. There are non-swing states that are great at it. And then there's Nevada that's not great at it at all. And part of it is, again, a failure of leadership. And, and assigning that blame can go all around, but you can, be, you can be absolutely sure that the members of Congress who, who see these programs every day are trying to get the word out. It's the state and county and local governments that need to start getting informed and getting the, the word out that these opportunities exist. So I kind of went over all of this already. And uh, what a lot of the manufacturing grants do, including the, um, uh, what's happening at the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, 
is a real focus on return on investment. It's not the traditional ways in which we think of federal funding, which is just cut them a check. Cut them a check and hope for the best. It's actually going in and thinking, if we invest this amount of money, how much are we going to get back? How much is Nevada going to get back? How much is Maine going to get back? How much is Minnesota going to get back? But how much I I can we generate from this grant? In the same way, hiring liaisons, hiring grant writers in the state government, hiring people in the state cabinet agencies who are going to maybe be a little bit expensive, maybe not that expensive, but who are going to help your, your cities, who are going to help your, your state agencies apply for more funds, that's huge return on investment. So let's say you hire, you hire 10 grant writers for this state, just for a hypothetical. I don't know what they would earn. I don't, I don't know what the labor market is anywhere for grant writers, um, uh, nor, nor, no matter for here. But let's say it's a million dollars a year once you factor in salary and overhead and, and uh, benefits. Well, if, the, if they bring you in, uh, your shortfall, your $300 million shortfall yearly compared to New Mexico, I'm pretty sure it pays for itself. That's a pretty good return on investment. I mean, if you don't want a 300 to 1 investment, I'll, I'll take it for you. I will, I will take that investment any day. But also, it's about restructuring companies, restructuring agencies, consolidating federal agencies. These programs uh, within agriculture, uh, within the Commerce Department, there have been efforts to streamline the federal government in a way that will help streamline the, dis, uh, the distribution of funds. And those funds, of course, go to streamline the processes that are holding up active production within the states. So a couple of examples that um, I will, uh, uh, I'll talk about on this, and then I'll wrap it up. One, I'm going to plug some of our own people, the Race to the Shop grant, uh, grant idea. You've heard of Race to the Top, the education proposal. The Metro program, the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings uh, has the idea of Race to the Shop, which is creating, uh, using uh, innovation within the manufacturing uh, sector to create a grant program much like the Race to the Top, a competitive statewide program that forces states to come up with long-term ideas, long-term strategies to help improve manufacturing within their state. It reduces the number of restrictions that the federal government puts on that money and says, do everything that you can to make this sector work. There are going to be protections against waste, fraud, and abuse, of course, but they want you to have the freedom, like they do in the Race to the Top education grants, to, to, to make this money work. A and another one is the Make It in America grant program, which is uh, being floated right now by uh, David Cicilline, a congressman from Rhode Island, and, and Senator uh, Gillibrand from New York, that is, uh, that's going to help manufacturers who are willing to keep production facilities in the United States and employ more workers get the, not the startup money they need, but the continuing money they need to streamline that factory to help. It's essentially a grant program version of the manufacturing, manufacturing extension partnership that I talked about before. It's a great bill, but there's a little bit of federal spending in it, so it's never going to pass the House of Representatives that's, that's controlled by Republicans. And it's a real failure because within it, it's not just grant money, it's revolving loan funds that are eventually going to be paid back. Um, it's, a, it's a way to make, to invest a little bit of federal funding to make a lot of private uh, money come out of it. And, and these are the opportunities that are being lost in Nevada and the Mountain West region and, and all across the U.S. So summing up quickly, Nevada is not living up to its potential. There needs to be a greater information environment that helps um, individuals, nonprofits, companies, and uh, state, local, uh, state, and municipal, state, local, and municipal governments uh, get the funds that are entitled to them, to get what I say either is their fair share or what Nevada has the potential to do is get more than their fair share. The Mountain West has growing political clout. You're going to have senators here. Who, you've lost a couple of senators who had a lot of um, power. Uh, you're going you're gonna to have people who are coming up now who are going to stay in the Senate for maybe longer than you'd like, but they're going to have that power. And you're also you also have uh, Nevada is a swing state, and as I said earlier, in four years, Arizona is going to be a swing state, too, barring, barring something odd happening. So uh, one of the keys, again, not to belabor the point, create strategies at the state level to capitalize on politics and turning those politics into capital. Get to know the presidential administration, even if you hate them, even if you want to throw the bums out. Get to know them. They have the wallet. 
they, they are going to help you achieve what you need to achieve. So you can take their money and still dislike them. I assume it's like getting your, your interest on a Bank of America um, uh, investment. You don't have to like the CEO, but y you, know, you, can, you, can, you can still take his money. But the key, the, the final key is effort and expertise. It pays dividends. It literally pays dividends. You have to invest at the state level in grantsmanship and in uh, having the administrative capacity not just to apply for these grants, but also to administer them and, and make them work uh, for you as best you can. So thanks a lot. I'd be glad to take your questions. Mm. Potatoes has Harry Reid brought home. <laughs> so um, I, I actually haven't uh, looked specifically at Harry Reid's uh, uh, behavior in terms of distributed politics. Um, I do know that a lot of the defense dollars that come to this state um, are certainly secured uh, by him. I've, I've, I've read some uh, news reports about his, his interest in making sure that some uh, airports stay open uh, when, when they've been slated for closure. And so my guess is that, that Senator Reid does a lot behind the scenes a as much as he does in front of the camera. He, he, that's his way in, in a political matter, at least in a campaign matter. Um, it's, it's also a means of him making sure that the state is, is doing what it can, but there's a limit to that. And that is that um, if, if the state isn't positioning itself to do what it can to get these funds, even if it's just a minimal amount of positioning itself, there's only so much the majority leader can do to induce the administration uh, to, to take this action. And so I, I certainly can't say that uh, comment specifically tor toward his behaviors, but uh, the, all of the ingredients are in place, as I said, to make this work, and, and it's just not working here. Yeah? Um, well, working on uh, balance and sustainability. And I, th I think Senator Reid, and there are some other lo local leaders, have been working on some of the areas of green energy, and I think solar and so on. Mm -hmm. I, I know that with wind energy, I'm, I'm very interested in that. And you know, if you just take a penny per kilowatt hour with wind energy, my imprecise calculation indicated you could get paid back in seven years. So I think it's pretty easy to do return on investment, but uh, today's New York Times had a very interesting article on return on investment that you, I don't know if you've ever looked at these things, but they were saying how Goldman Sachs had been able to secure state and local bonds to increase the size of their skyscraper in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in Manhattan. And again, of course, tax subsidies pay for that at, at all levels. And of course, they're getting money from the Federal Reserve as well. I just can't believe that the Federal Reserve doesn't diversify its lo loaning. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the question is is basically, uh, have, have you looked at anything like those, or particularly, I guess, the municipal grants and, sure. and those kind of things? So I haven't looked um, okay. beneath the federal level. Um, the the oh. data the data is is really well kept at the at the federal mm -hmm. level by first the Office of Management and Budget, then it's preserved by the uh, and up kept by the Census Bureau. Uh, they, uh, the data for uh, the state level uh, distribution of funds is much harder to get. A lot of states don't report it. They don't report it publicly. They don't uh, keep records as well as, I as well as the federal government. I mean, the United States government in terms of data record keeping is premier in the world. I, I, I mean, it's a means of transparency. It's a means of accounting. But uh, you, you don't get better than that. And then, so it's tough enough at the, um, uh, at the, st at the state level. The municipal level, it, it's not even, I mean, it's not even worth trying as a researcher to get it. But you're right that there are a lot of opportunities, and I, I focus on uh, the federal opportunities because that's what I know best. But, but you're right, I mean, these same, these same forces, these same ideas, these same um, needs exist beneath the federal level. And if the data were there, someone probably smarter than me would, would take a look at them. But um, as I said, I'm focusing on the federal because that's what I know best and the data is the best. Yeah, right here. I just wanted to say I, I really enjoyed the lecture, Thanks. and I was almost like upset <laughs> when you <laughs> talked about how how um, how grossly like we're not getting these funds and we should, especially you know how how Nevada is situated, especially with the reduction of, of of funding for higher education, and then how you know recently students like went up to Carson City and were petitioning. 
for this, and it, it kind of blows my mind that you know they that the university or maybe people that are that um, there's a whole department over here that does grant funding for them to get involved mm -hmm. with the legislators and try to work some kind of balance. But I was wondering specifically on some of the numbers now about how much does Nevada get for grant funding, like um, like a year or a quarterly? And I was wondering like what percentage, like are we are we lacking? Is it like a hundred percent that we could be getting? Um, so those are the questions. So um, it's hard to it, it's hard to quantify capacity, right? Because state needs are different and, and all. But the best way to do it is to compare to uh, similarly situated geographically and population-wise states and, and states with similar needs. And, and as I said, uh, compared to New Mexico, it's falling uh, two, three hundred million dollars short in a year. Um, that's a that's a hundred percent difference. Uh, they're getting anywhere from 250 to 300 million dollars a year in terms of the grants uh, that I'm looking at and, and for for disclosure this is m this is most of the discretionary grants that are being allocated by the government it isn't um, all of them because there are uh, classified grant programs that they don't report the data on as you would expect and there are a few other uh, funky ones but uh, I can't say about the classified uh, ones but the data that I have to um, exclude for a variety of reasons is, is less than 1% of the data set. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, when states that you should be at par with, or, or better, I mean, New Mexico's not a swing state anymore. It's not really, it, no one's spending advertising money at the presidential level in New Mexico, and their political clout has reduced dramatically in the Senate and in the House. And so uh, you should be doing much better than New Mexico and you're, falling, you're getting half as much money as they are in a given year. Some years it's actually more than that. In the back. Um, we just did a study across the state interviewing department heads and others around this issue, and so the, your concept about a failure of leadership hits home. My question is, though, what does that look like when you operationalize that or you try to change this? Because when we were talking to some of the electeds, they were saying, look, this has come up every single session for the last 10, 15 years. Every session we have voted not to invest in this infrastructure. And there's lots of reasons for that. But is there any example of a state that you can think of that has done this the right way, where you literally saw a turnaround? And if so, what does that look like? Because it seems like it's chicken or the egg here, where we make the case, they don't have the money to invest in the grant writing, so we don't get the grant. So then there's not a match. You know, there's always sure. a reason, and it's been discussed multiple times. So who's done it right, and how do we learn from that? So a good model, um, a good model to look at is uh, is Maryland. They they've really invested in, yeah. in grant writing, and, and they've been they've been quite good at it. Again, this is well, the, the state has um, a very powerful senator from it, in, in Barbara Mikulski, um, and. It, but it's not a but it's not a swing state. It, it, yeah. No one does anything in in Maryland at the presidential level. Um, so they, based on pure politics, they shouldn't be doing all that well. It's also a wealthy state. I, I mean, uh, there are there are some areas in the West that that face Appalachian challenges. Though we have a commission in place to help. Um, and then, of course, there are, there are urban issues that, that Baltimore faces. But it's a, a very well-to-do state. So so need in a lot of ways is. Reduced, but it's it's doing it's doing a, a, a very good job. In addition, uh, I, I can't comment specifically on on the Nevada case in terms of what's going on specifically in state cabinet agencies, uh, uh, like like you've mentioned. But what I will say is that mo in most states, cabinet officials, commissioners, uh, agency heads, do have a discretionary supply of funds, as the president does, as all of his cabinet secretaries do. And so to say, we'd love to, we would love to write, ha hire grant writers, but the legislature just keeps voting it down, seems like a cop-out to me. Um, it, it, if every state said that, it would absolutely be a cop-out. It, 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 my guess is it, it's the case here. And also, if you think of it as a short-term investment that has a longer-term uh, payout, you can, yeah. if you apply for enough grants in an agency and you get enough of overhead as part of those grants, and, and, and almost every federal grant comes with, with overhead abilities, you just keep continuing to fund your grant writers out of the pot. And so it takes a one-shot investment that could come from a discretionary fund within the agencies. It could come from a discretionary fund within the, uh, the governor's office. Um, but it, it needs to happen. And, and the other way is, is a failure to argue properly before the legislature. I don't think that um, uh, 
uh, uh, cabinet agencies are being effective enough in putting the numbers up there and saying, look what Maryland did, look what Connecticut did, look what South Carolina did. They hired this many people and then yeah. their, their numbers boosted. And so uh, I always say that, that putting numbers in front of people uh, is, is the best way to convince them. Of course, I'm a political scientist trained in statistical methods, so I have to continue to think that or else I'm gonna get really sad. But, um, but I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's the case. Sir, you had a question? No, what, what if it, one comment, one question. Uh, I think Harry Reid did a great job in keeping the, uh, the, the place where they were gonna store the nuclear closed. Yeah. Or he's got it closed completely. So for that alone, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly thankful for that. The question is, you mentioned Maryland a lot, and there's a college there called Goucher. Mm -hmm. And they teach grant writing. Yeah. It's a course. It's a two-year yeah. course taught at night. Do we have anything in Nevada, like in Las Vegas, like that, or do they? Have, I mean, could I take a course here, being retired, on grant writing, and then just, just kind of do my thing? So um, I'll leave. Uh, I, I'll leave the the course availability up to someone who's much smarter than me about that. But what I will tell you is that it shouldn't be uh, understated how much. Uh, top tier research universities train in grantsmanship. I took a class in my PhD program on how to write a grant. It worked out pretty well. Um, it worked out for a lot of my, my fellow students there. And it's not hard, it was a semester long class and uh, it was sort of an interactive process that doesn't require a PhD student to do it. And I'll tell you a little bit about how it was structured. Uh, the first week you have your sort of orientation to the class and, and the professor said, you have a research idea, go home and write the first sentence of your grant proposal. And all of us, 17 of us in the class, went back and wrote our, grant, uh, our first line of our grant proposal. And he said, and email it to me. I thought, well, this is gonna be the easiest class I've ever taken. <laughs> a sentence a week? I'm used to reading a thousand pages a week. And then he put them up on the overhead, and we tore each other apart. And the next week, you wrote the first sentence again, and you, did the interactive process and you tore it apart. The next week was the first paragraph of your research project. And it became interactive and then it was two pages. And we were, at the time, we were focused on National Science Foundation grants to assist your dissertation. And so the, I think it was a maximum 10 page proposal or at least it was at the time. So by the end of the semester, your final project was to have a, a very well uh, polished 10 page proposal with your one page cover sheet that was ready to send to NSF, essentially. And that was after a couple of weeks before your 10-page proposal got ripped apart by your fellow students. And so it's processes like these that, that can be done anywhere for any group of people. Like I said, it doesn't require a, a PhD or PhD students to do it. And top-tier research universities um, have people who are very well trained at this, who could do it at the university at night, who could do it at community colleges, if you could get the funding to fund the community colleges, and, and or, or some other sort of a, a adult uh, education classes that can help people all over uh, states to do it. Please. Hi, um, just a question. You, of all the, the states that are really successful, are most of those grants going to uh, government entities or so what 80 90 percent or more oh so um, what I'll say is that there is uh, in terms of these grants that that's generally not the generally not the case the the block grants and the formula grants uh, typically do what happens is if you if you look at the data the way that the states report it and the federal government ultimately reports it is that the oftentimes the first recipient is the state cabinet agency because the m yeah. funds flow through there, then they're distributed to the recipients. This isn't true of all grant programs, but it's true for a lot. So to give you an example, um, they also code the data by congressional district. The congressional district in the United States that gets more federal funding than any one, Albany, the, the county that Albany sits in. The next one is the one Sacramento sits in. I can assure you that the, um, uh, the people in Albany, the, the residents of Albany and Schenectady are not getting $1.5 billion in grants every year. And so it's hard to sort of tease out exactly where, but most of these grants are going to 
uh, local, uh, county, uh, local and county governments to nonprofits to universities, universities with uh, medical centers, universities with large research departments in them, universities that employ uh, large chemistry labs, large physics labs. Uh, those are the places that are ultimately getting most of these funds. And it's not necessarily going in to fund 40% uh, of your health and human services department in, in the state of Nebraska. There, there, there's certainly some of that, but uh, a lot of this is being trickle, uh, trickled out elsewhere. And is there truly a, a, a cash matching uh, element to that, those grants that you were referring to tonight? So, excuse me, uh, most grants, uh, grants vary pretty dramatically in this sense. There are some that are just, so, uh, what I, I've been talking a lot about National Science Foundation grants, there's no matching there. Um, they, they, they don't have that capacity nor the, the uh, legislative, uh, the, there's no legislation to, to have that. Um, there are certainly educa education grants that are matching. A lot of times the uh, uh, block grant programs have matching requirements. A lot of times the discretionary grants that I talk about tonight, uh, that I've talked about tonight, those come with the fewest strings, the fewest contingencies, the fewest conditions, um, and that's what can make them really appealing for a lot of places where you well know the transportation funds regulate uh, uh, blood alcohol levels and speed limits, and there are a whole host of strings that are attached to the formula grant funds for your federal highway, uh, for your federal highway dollars, but there's much less of that for discretionary grants. Let me thank John. Sure. You got a great sense tonight of the knowledge and the passion and the communication skills that he's brought to campus this week and has also been demonstrating in our classrooms with UNLV undergraduates and graduates and with some of our faculty colleagues. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, John will be around for some questions. He'll be available to follow up. We'll have his PowerPoint up on our website tomorrow and the actual lecture will be up uh, in an immediate future as well. Uh, I hope this started a conversation or continued a conversation, one that we're keenly interested in, in helping here at the Brookings Mountain West and at the Lindsay Institute at UNLV. We gotta do something, right? We've got to do better. <laughs> so let's figure that out. Thanks for coming. Our next le uh, lecture uh, next week, we'll bring out a colleague of John's. We'll change the subject a little bit. Philip Wallach will be here. He'll be talking about Changing Policy Without Changing Laws is the title of his, his lecture. It has to do with addressing climate change and the Clean Air Act, another important topic for this city and this region. So I hope you can join us next week. Thank you.